In this chapter, we're talking about microscopy, staining techniques, and different classification techniques used in microbiology. First thing, quickly, obviously we're working with very small things when we are uh, discussing anything in the field of microbiology. And just to put a point of reference, a uh, quick review on the metric units of length. The basic unit in the metric system is a meter. Uh, it's about 39 inches. And remember in the metric system, everything is uh, a base 10 uh, unit. So a decimeter, there are 10 of those in one meter. A centimeter, there's 100 of those in one meter. A millimeter, there's 1,000 of them. A micrometer, as you can see, there would be 1 million of those in a meter. Uh, the diameter of a white blood cell is, they vary in sizes, between 5 and 25 micrometers. So uh, a lot of your uh, bacteria are going to be very, very small. Uh, a nanometer is a thousand times smaller even than that. So in nanometer, you're talking now with about sizes of viruses. So extremely, extremely small. <coughs> First, we're going to talk about microscopy. That's uh, different principles of using the microscope, how it works, how we're able to see things, etc. So the first thing is just a brief review in terms of wavelengths. Um, you have different types of rays. You have gamma rays, x-rays. Visible light is only a very small section of the wavelength spectrum. Uh, and so different microscopes are going to be able to use different forms of this. A light microscope is going to be within that visible light range, but then we extend down from that. Basic physics says that whenever light passes from one medium to another, it is going to be bent. It will continue on, but at an angle. And Keep this in mind when uh, you are using a microscope from the standpoint, the physics behind it, that the light waves are passing through the um, air. It's going to pass through lenses. So anytime it passes through a lens, it's going to bend and angle in a different direction. In a microscope, uh, the shape of the lens will play a role as to the angle at which that bending occurs, plus the fact that you go through multiple uh, lenses. When you're looking through it, you have uh, the light coming up through the condenser, which is focusing the light up on the specimen. After it goes through the specimen, it comes up, it's going to pass through your objective lens, and then through the ocular lens or the, the eyepiece. And then finally, you're going to see it. The bottom line is what you are looking at. It Obviously, the whole purpose of the microscope is to enlarge it. But also keep in mind that it's going to be inverted and reversed. And that's due to the, the light waves bedding. Once again, in terms of looking at the size, you're looking at very small things. Um, there are going to be limits as to what you can see for certain size resolution as being able to distinguish between two separate objects. Now with uh, the naked eye or with the unaided eye, uh, some cells you can see, like a chicken egg that is considered uh, a cell, so you can certainly see that. You can see things like ticks and fleas, large protozoans you would be able to see. As you move increasingly smaller, um, then you get into the range where you would be using a light microscope, which we abbreviate LM. Basically measure or allows you to see things within the range of 200 nanometers to 10 millimeters. Um, you'd be able to obviously see red blood cell. You would be able to see chloroplasts. Um, you start getting small and that you, you can see bacteria, they are very small, but you will be able to see them. Can you see viruses with the light microscope? No, you cannot. They are much too small. Can you see a lot of those internal organelles like 
the ribosomes? Can you see proteins? Can you see the DNA strand looking like that double helix? No, you cannot. Um, and certainly you cannot see at the atomic level. It is just, just too small. So to see smaller things, uh, we have scanning electron microscopes, transmission electron microscopes, which allow you to see even smaller. And then there are things such as the atomic force microscope and the scanning tunnel microscope. So as you can tell from this picture, different types of microscopes do allow us to see uh, a range of different sizes. So you kind of pick what size uh, frame are you working at determines which kind of microscope you're going to use. Some general principles of microscopy, contrasts, differences between two objects or between an object and the background, and that's going to help you uh, distinguish between two separate objects or to help with that resolution. Staining is going to help increase the contrast. Uh, and adjusting the light intensity is also going to help with that. With light microscopy, uh, bright field microscopes are very simple. Basically, have a single magnifying lens, it's, and it's very similar to just using a magnifying glass. That's what uh, Antoine von Leeuwenhoek used to first view microorganisms. A compound microscope will use a series of lenses. So the light's going to pass through the specimen, goes into that objective lens. Uh, for seeing bacteria, oftentimes we will use, well, we just about always use uh, oil, what we call an oil immersion lens. That's going to increase the resolution. Uh, once again, so you can see things as separate uh, objects and not merging as one. And then there's going with a compound scope, there will be additionally an ocular lens or the eyepiece lens. To determine the total magnification, you just simply multiply the magnification of the objective lens times the magnification of the ocular lens. The highest magnification that you will be able to get with a compound microscope would be a thousand times. So this has shown you uh, a, a typical compound light microscope. This one has two ocular lenses, two eyepieces to it. Uh, in the lab, you become familiar working with them. Um, just very briefly, you've, you've got the ocular lens. That's where you're going to be looking through. Uh, they are attached to the body. And you have the arm. That's what you help to hold. Uh, the microscope. The objective lenses are on a revolving nose piece, so you can move them. Uh, you have your primary scanning, and then you increase uh, the longer length objective lenses have the higher magnification. The stage is what's holding your uh, slide that has the specimen on it. The condenser is underneath the stage that helps to focus the light up through the specimen. The diaphragm that's typically below that will uh, control the amount of light that's entering into the condenser. Your light is down on the bottom. You have a coarse uh, adjustment knob and a fine adjustment knob. This helps you to focus. And this just shows uh, what happens when you use the immersion oil, how it increases that resolution. As you can see on A's without the oil and the light as it comes up through the slide tends to scatter. With the oil it helps to focus it and so therefore you have more light that's coming into the lens. Another type of light microscopy is dark field microscopes. This will help when you're looking at something that's very pale. Um, so the specimen is going to appear light against a dark background. So that's helping to increase the contrast so that you can see it better. Phase microscopes are often used to examine living organisms or a type of specimen that could be damaged when you attach it to a slide or when you stain it. Um, there's two types. There's a, a phase contrast and then a different differential interference contrast microscope. 
So in this picture in the upper left, the uh, photo A is just using a bright field. You can see there's been a staining process down here, so it's kind of difficult to see. You can see a nucleus of the eukaryotic cell and then the smaller bacterium that are there. You take um, the similar cell and you use dark field. Now you can see how it's much easier to see all of those different bacteria. On C is phase contrast, so you're using differences in light patterns there. And then differential interference contrast is in D. So depending on what you want to see, use a different microscope. Fluorescent microscopes, this is where you have direct UV light source at the specimen. And so um, basically the specimen is going to glow. <laughs> Uh, and it increases the contrast there. Some cells naturally fluoresce, others you have to add a fluorescent dye to it. This is used a lot for uh, diagnostic purposes. As you can see, the photo in, uh, on A on the left side is without the dye, and then B, how it fluoresces. Um, I knew someone who developed a technique for using fluorescent dyes for being able to observe. Uh, she did two, had two different types of dyes. One was, was for observing bacteria in soil, and the other was for observing fungi in soil. They fluoresce different colors. Uh, for that, her work, it was very effective because she would often... Uh, be given soil samples, which obviously is usually going to be dark colored. So it's tough. How do you get the sample and do stain? They wanted to know how many living bacteria were in there. And so she could take the samples uh, and add the dye. And she had a whole system set up of then when it fluoresced, such as seen here in B, then she could sit there and count and calculate, okay, how many uh, bacteria per gram of soil were in that particular sample. And this is another example of immunofluorescence. This is what is used in, for diagnostic purposes oftentimes, where you are looking to see, okay, do you have a certain bacteria in a patient sample? And you add antibodies, which are going to bind to the bacteria. And on the other end of the antibody, you have this fluorescent dye. So if the antibody attaches, then the whole organism is going to glow as seen in the figure or the photo in B. Confocal microscopes, this also uses fluorescent dyes. Um, the resolution tends to be increased and you can generate three images using this. Now electron microscopes um, are going to be able to see a much, much higher magnification. Uh, so obviously you can see smaller things, you can get a lot more detailed. Uh, you can see the smaller specimens such as viruses, some of the internal cellular structures, molecules, large atoms you might be able to see. Now there are two types of electron microscopes. There's a transmission electron microscope and then a scanning electron microscope. This is showing a picture and some samples of a transmission electron microscope. You take your sample, you have to do the preparation process of it, and basically it's like you're taking slices of the sample. So as you can see in the photo and see, you can see the internal structures. Uh, it tends to be 2D in nature, but you are able to see uh, the internal structures. Now, scanning electron microscope, these are images that you see here. You are able to see more of a 3D image. So you can see certainly the um, outer surface of various um, samples. The picture in D is Streptococcus. Those bacteria, as you can see, they're individual bacteria connected together in a chain. Uh, so you can see things like that, or in B, the aspergillus is a fungus, and you can see those individual spores. But you do not see the internal structures. 
So once again, you have to decide what is the information I'm trying to gain. If all I need to see is the external surface, well, then I use the scanning. If I need to see internal structures, then I need to use the transmission. One thing I also want to say, yes, you can get increased magnification, but once again, you need to figure out what information are you wanting to learn, and that helps to determine what type of microscope you're going to use. The preparation process uh, that you have to do to prepare the sample to be seen with either transmission or scanning electron microscopes, it does kill the sample. So if you're wanting to look at a living cell, you cannot use an electron microscope. Probe microscopy will magnify more than 100 million times, so obviously you can see very small structures. There's two types, scanning, tunneling, and also atomic force. And you can see examples here, the, the probe microscopy, you get nice three-dimensional uh, images on some. You can see in B, uh, the DNA strand. You can see an enzyme there, so you can see quite small. This table is a comparison of the different types of microscopes. What are particular special features for that particular scope? Gives an example of what it looks like. Um, which one would you use for different things? So, as you can see, it starts here with the light microscopes, progresses to the electron microscopes, and finally to the probe microscopes. So like I say, which microscope are you going to use? It depends on the information that you're trying to obtain. Uh, do you need living versus dead sample? Does it matter? And like everything else in life, it's going to also depend on money. Uh, the type of light microscopes that are typically used in diagnostic labs and teaching labs uh, typically will run probably brand new around $2,000 at least. Electron microscopes are very, very expensive. Probe microscopes are very, very expensive. So like everything else, you have to look at what's the information I'm wanting to get and what is my budget like? Because your budget may not be able to allow to have uh, a microscope that you're wanting. Most microorganisms are going to be difficult to see without any type of stain, so you have to add a, a dye or a stain to increase that contrast. Um, and before you add the stain, you don't just add it, you have to prepare the specimen for that staining. So the first thing you're going to have to do is what we call heat fix. So you're going to take a, a microscope slide, a blank slide, and you take your culture, maybe it was a liquid culture, maybe it was um, from a petri dish. You use your loop and you, you smear it onto that slide. Some people use like a wax pencil or marker and draw a circle and they only smear it in that. Um, it's a personal preference. Some people like to do that. Uh, personally, I don't. I just smear it on the slide. Let it air dry. And then you need to what we call heat fix it. And that means you need to pass it through a flame. Uh, so normally you have a Bunsen burner at your workstation. And you just pass it through. Um, you can see what often what helps is if you have like a clothespin or something to attach to the slide. That way your hand's not right close to the flame. That's also going to help, I'll tell you right now, when you go do the staining to keep the stain off your fingers. When I was in school, we used to say, oh, you knew what stain the microbiology students were learning by looking at our fingers. Uh, so usually what I do is I just pass the, the slide. You just pass it from side to left to right, just through the, the flame. I usually do it three times, just kind of once you've smeared it, it air dries, and then just kind of one, two, three, through the flame, and that that's sufficient. What is the reason for doing this? Well, number one, it's going to kill the sample. You don't want the living bacteria, say, on that slide that you're going to be working with. So it's going to kill it. 
It helps to adhere or stick it to the slide. And it's also going to make, remember, most of these organisms have cell walls. Bacteria, most of them have a, a fairly significant cell wall. And so by heat fixing it, that's going to help make it more permeable to the dye. It's going to allow the, the dye to penetrate in, so you can actually see it. So there are several different types of dyes. Um, the acidic dye uses state will stain alkaline structures, basic dyes stain acidic uh, structures. A simple stain is when you're using just one dye. And there, like I say, there are several different ones that we use. Three of the most common ones are crystal violet, which is going to look uh, kind of a purple color, saffron, which is red, and methylene blue, which is a blue color. With a simple stain, you can determine the size of the organism that you are viewing. You can determine the shape, and you can determine the arrangement of the cells. Are they in uh, pairs? Are they in long chains, short chains? So here you have an example of simple dyes. Uh, when you are looking at these, you can see in a, that there are a lot of small spheres there. There's a couple of uh, rods. They're pretty much uh, singles. And then in B, you have, once again, a few, looks like maybe a few rods, but it's mostly um, the spheres. I'm used to calling them cocci. Um, there's a way that you could determine the size of each individual cell. They're not in big clumps, they're not in long chains. Once again, they tend to be uh, individuals here. A differential stain is when you're going to use two stains. It is by using two different dyes, two different stains, it allows you to distinguish between two different uh, cells. There are some differential stains that are used quite a lot in microbiology. The most fundamental ba basic stain that you will use in microbiology is the Graham stain. There is also what's known as an acid fast stain. There's an endospore stain, and there are various other histological stains that are used. For the Graham stain, uh, the major classification scheme for identification of bacteria, the first step is going to determine the results from the gram stain. Is the bacteria gram positive or is it gram negative? And the differences between these has to do with the composition of the cell wall. When we use the gram stain, there's four steps that you will use for doing this. The first step is that you will now, for any of the stains, you will always smear it, and then you will always heat fix it first. So it's going to be assumed that that has already been done. So for the gram stain, you will then flood the slide with crystal violet. You leave it on for one minute, and then you will rinse it. At that point, all of the cells are going to look purple. Then you're going to flood the slide with iodine for one minute and then you're going to rinse it with water. The iodine is what we call a mordant. It's going to help really strongly um, fix that first stain. All the cells are going to look purple. Then the third step is the slide's going to be rinsed. Um, it's a solution of ethanol and acetone. It's often Sometimes we'll use like ethyl alcohol in there, and it's rinse. Now, some people will tell you do two rinses for 15 seconds. I personally, the way I learned it and the way I prefer to do it, it's, it's what works for me, is that I will add the alcohol on for 30 seconds and then rinse it. The alcohol is a decolorization step. This is where the difference in the cell wall comes into play. That alcohol is going to pull off that outer membrane. Remember, gram negatives have a lipo uh, polysaccharide outer membrane. It's, it's outside of the peptidoglycan. And essentially, the alcohol is going to dissolve that. It's like it rips it off. 
And so when it does that, and then you rinse the crystal violet dye that had been there, there's nothing holding it in place, so it rinses out. So what's going to happen now, if you were to look at the slide, the gram positives will still be purple. The alcohol doesn't do anything to the gram positive cells. They don't have that extra membrane. They have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, and the crystal violet is... Remember, peptidoglycan kind of looks like a scaffolding, so the crystal violet dyes with iodine attached to it are all in those open spaces. So the gram positive is still going to look purple, but the gram negative is now colorless because they only had essentially one layer of the peptidoglycan, that scaffolding. You ripped off the outer layer, so where does the dye go? It goes off with the water when you rinse. So now the fourth step is when you're going to add the saffron red uh, dye. You add that for one minute, rinse it, and then you're going to blot it, uh, the slide, and then look at it. So your gram positive cells are purple, gram negative ones now have picked up the uh, saffron dye, so they're going to look pink. It's a differential stain. You use two dyes. You can just look at it and distinguish between the pink and the purple cells. There are some bacteria that have an extra kind of a waxy uh, layer to them. Mycobacterium is an example, uh, causes tuberculosis. And so for those, they don't take up the gram stain very well. And so what you have to do is what we call an acid fast stain. And you'll notice that. Uh, some things will look red, and this is also a differential stain. The cells will look uh, that dark blue. You can do a stain to uh, look for spores. The, when you do a spore stain, the vegetative cells will look uh, red, but the endospore that's inside of them will stain green. As I said earlier, there are also differential stains that can be used when doing histological staining. Uh, there are a couple of common ones that are used here. And then we have some special stains um, that will be used. They tend to be simple stains that are used to try to look for certain specific structures in the microorganisms. Uh, some of these special stains are things like a negative stain, flagella stain, and fluorescent stains. When you do a negative stain, it's going to stain the background, and the bacteria typically remains clear. As you can see in this picture, this is a negative stain, and you can see the bacteria has actually picked up some of the dye, but the capsule that surrounds it remains clear, and it's very obvious to see it when the entire background has picked up uh, the darker stain. The capsule, in this case, you might be looking for it because um, bacteria that have a capsule around it tend to be able to hide from our cells that help protect us with our immune system. They're able to evade those cells and so they tend to be more pathogenic or more virulent. And so you may want to be looking at uh, specimens from your patient to see, in this case, this is with Klebsiella pneumoniae. Um, it is a bacteria without the capsule, it's non-pathogenic. It doesn't make you sick, but if the capsule is there, it's, adding, it's, it's good for the bacteria, but it's bad for your patient. Flagella stains, uh, some bacteria, not all, but some do have flagella, and you can use the location, the arrangement of them to help. You cannot identify solely on that, but it's going to be like another piece of the puzzle to help you identify what you have. As you can see, this particular bacteria has multiple flagella on it. So this table is just showing some of the stains that are used in uh, light microscopy, your simple stains, your differential stains, the special stains. Of all of these, I would say your gram stain is the most important for diagnostic purposes in microbiology. 
staining for electron microscopy. Here, the chemicals are going to use heavy metals, um, certainly with transmission. And I say the process of preparing the sample is going to kill the sample. So how do we classify, how do we identify the microorganisms? Well, taxonomy is that specialized field that deals with the classification. How do you name them? And no, you don't get to name them after yourself if you find a new uh, specimen. You need to be able to properly identify and name them and figure out where a new organism fits in with the whole classification scheme. Basically, understand uh, which other organisms that may be similar or related to. It helps you to understand the evolutionary process. Now, Linnaeus is the one who developed a system for classifying organisms. Now, when he developed this, he did it where you classify them according to common physical characteristics and you group similar ones together. Those organisms that can interbreed would be called species. And he also developed for naming the what we call binomial nomenclature, where you use genus and species or the, the names. The taxonomic scheme that we still use today is the broadest is going to be domain. There are three different domains. From there, you have various kingdoms. From kingdoms, that can be separated down into different phylums. I'll say right now, fungi are different. They will call them divisions. That's the same thing as a phylum. From there, you have classes. Below that would be orders, then family, and finally down to genus, and then species. So species can interbreed with each other if you're of the same species. Now, at the time, way back that Linnaeus developed this, he only had two kingdoms. Uh, at one point, it was changed to have five kingdoms. And they, they kind of changed back and forth. Some people have been proposing that um, possibly adding others. So just be aware it's constantly changing. Now, when Linnaeus developed this taxonomic category system, it was trying to catalog things to, to get a handle on on how we name things, how we catalog, how we keep track of everything. One thing I will say is that there have been a lot of changes in the past, say 25 years, with taxonomy. And part of that has to do with the advancement of science. Initially, things were classified according to those common physical characteristics. As we, you know, science is an ever-changing field. As we learn more, uh, in science, the technology advances. As technology advances, it allows more discoveries in science. So they go hand in hand, and they're, they're both constantly moving forward. With the advances in DNA technology, what has happened is people who specialize solely in taxonomy have gone back and said, we have a lot more information at our fingertips now. And so let's go back. And the idea is the more closely two organisms are, then the more similar their DNA should be. So they've gone back and started looking at all of these different organisms that were already classified. And you'll notice that they're often having to redo and kind of remake the, the family tree, if you will. Uh, that looking at the DNA has changed some of the taxonomy of where things were placed. So with domains in the previous chart I was showing you that yes, currently there are three domains, eukarya, bacteria, and archaea. Um, so all living organisms will be placed into one of these three different domains. As I've said before, there have been discussions whether viruses are living or not and where they should be placed. Some people do not believe that they are um, a living organism, that it's more just chemicals there, but it's not a living organism. And they often, one of their biggest arguments is that 
because viruses cannot reproduce solely by themselves. They need to have a host. Another group of people feel that, well, it doesn't matter how they do it, they are able to reproduce. It doesn't matter that it's dependent upon a host cell, so they should be classified as, as living organisms. That is up to you to decide. Look at the information on both sides and make an informed decision on that. Um, it's one of those areas where I feel, number one, I'm not going to tell you my personal feeling because this is not the place for me to to do that. I'm just letting you know that there are two different sides to this and it's okay to disagree. That's fine. There's, um, If I were to ask you how you felt about it, I would be looking more at, not that there's a right or wrong answer, but how do you defend your choice? Can you intelligently argue one side or the other? But keep in mind that um, with anything in life, we need to be respectful of each other. There Recently I was reading something where there have been some individuals who are proposing if viruses should be classified as living organisms, where do we put them in this whole classification scheme? They don't really fit anywhere. And so some people have been discussing, should we be adding a fourth domain? And that's where the viruses would be placed. Who knows if this is going to happen? If it were to happen, who knows how long it would take? And in some ways, I'll tell you right now, people who discuss this issue, um, scientists are like anyone else. They have different viewpoints and there are different agreements and sometimes those two sides will discuss and talk forever and they can't come to a decision. I'm just letting you know that there are debates out there on this topic. So right now there are three domains. So how do you know how to classify things? Number one, like I say, you look at physical characteristics. Certainly in microbiology, what we look at, or in addition to this, will be biochemical testing. Because for physical characteristics, I mean, we're talking about things that we can only see by using a microscope. So how many physical characteristics can you actually, you know, look at? You'll need to do biochemical testing. Oftentimes, you need to do serological testing, or phage typing, or analysis of the nucleic acid. The physical characteristics, it's a place to start with. Um, sometimes your protozoans, fungi, algae, or parasitic worms can often be based, identified based on their morphology, what they look like, because they are larger. Certain bacteria may have very distinct appearances that can be used for identification of them. Uh, the bacteria Bacillus anthracis, which is the causative agent of anthrax, does have a very unique, distinct appearance to it uh, when it's growing on a petri dish. And if you saw that, it's like, yes, that's it. A lot of bacteria are just going to look yellowish or beige, and you're going to go, okay, which one is this? So then you'll need to progress on to doing biochemical tests. And that's, in microbiology, usually what we will use are the biochemical tests to be able to identify the bacteria in a medical lab. That's what they're going to do. A couple of examples of what we're talking about uh, in sample A. This would be a fermentation where there is a carbohydrate, a sugar that has been placed in the tube. You add a pH indicator. Um, typically, we use phenyl red which at a neutral pH is red color as seen in that. In, in photo A, it would be the right hand tube. Uh, that is what the tube would look like before you inoculated it. Some organisms, when you inoculate that, it's going to remain. Like that's not going to do anything. Some of them will produce an acid. Now, the fermentation process, the acid is the, one of the byproducts. Because there's a pH indicator in here, when that solution turns acidic, so a lower pH, it turns yellow. So that's what the yellow and both of the 
other tubes, the middle and the left one, it's yellow indicating that it is acid. Now in this particular test you also have a smaller tube inside the big tube that's inverted. Uh, and initially it's completely filled with fluid. And what you're looking for is sometimes the uh, fermentation process will produce only an acid, but sometimes it will also produce gas. And that inverted tube is catching the gas and, and you see a gas bubble. So you would record it as acid with gas. In picture B, you are looking for the production of hydrogen sulfide, which is black. The initial tube would be as seen on the right, and then on the left, after you've inoculated it and incubated it, it turns black. There is no question about that. So this is just an example of some of the biochemical tests. And you're not just running one, you're running several of these biochemical tests, recording which do you have positive or negatives, what are the results, and then that's going to help you to identify what organism you have. And if you're thinking, well, oftentimes, um, uh, say, uh, a busy hospital lab, do you have time to have all these different test tubes? No, we tend to do that in the lab or in research purposes uh, to sh show you how it's done, the understanding of why it's done, what's the theory behind it, the concept behind it. In a hospital lab, or obviously a space is of the essence, um, you have oftentimes these 96 well plates that you can buy that have the various biochemical tests. Uh, the media is already embedded in there, so each well is a different test. And you just take your sample and you add a drop to each one of these wells, and then you can just take the plate, incubate it, and you can also stack them so you can do several of them at once and then you look for color changes in those individual wells and you can see they are labeled um, such as there's one that's GLU that would be the glucose test and so uh, the H2S is a hydrogen sulfide similar to what you saw in the previous slide it, it is not black, so that would be a negative. And typically, you can also just run this through a machine that gives you a printout of the results. Serological testing here, you're looking for antigen antibody reactions uh, related to immune type responses. When you're infected with uh, microorganisms, it triggers your immune response. Part of that is going to uh, stimulate antibody production against that particular organism. And then you can use those antibodies to identify the organism that triggered its production. So you, there's a couple ways that you can use this. Uh, this is showing a type of uh, serological test where you have um, the antibody is going to bind with the antigen and if there's no binding, then you don't see anything. A positive result is when there's clumping, because the antibody, if the antigen is there, then it will clump together, and you will see that uh, fairly easily. Um, right now, there, or you can do this two different ways. You can see if the... Um, run a test where you have known antibodies to see if the antigen is present, um, meaning you have the exposure, you actually have, say, a virus, or you can test with a sample of the virus specimen and see if you have antigen or the antibody present. Phage typing. Phage is a, just a fancy way of saying virus. And so a bacteriophage is a virus that infects a bacteria. And one way that you can test for this is this would be a Petri dish that has been inoculated with a bacteria. As you can see, it says bacteria lawn. What that is where you have complete growth on the surface of that bacteria. You inoculated that Petri dish. You, you took a sample of the bacteria and you completely rubbed it so it covers the entire surface. And then you, the plaques, that is a clearing. If the virus is present and it infects the bacteria that's growing on that plate, it will clear. You get a clearing. You can actually see right through it. And we call those plaques. That is 
indicating the idea is it's indicating number one that the virus is there B it, you count the number of those plaques and that gives you an idea of the number of viruses that were present within that sample. Normally you inoculate the plate with a known vo liquid volume of bacteria so you might put a milliliter on there. So you would count the number of plaques and you can determine uh, if there's uh, I haven't counted these yet, but let's say there's 35 plaques, then you would say there are 35 viruses per milliliter of bacteria. You can also analyze the nucleic acid, um, look at your sample, and collect the DNA. You can do what we call a sequence of it with our technology now that is fairly easy to do. And Typically what they will record for taxonomic purposes is what we call the GC content. Remember the basis of DNA, you have A, T, C, and G. Well, usually what they will do is say, well, look at the DNA, analyze it, sequence it, and then they will tell you whether it's a high or a low GC content. You could say, okay, 65% of the basis are G and C. Dichotomous keys, this essentially is like a flowchart, and you can use this to help identify an unknown. So usually it's a case of where you are given a sample and you're like, okay, you may know it's say one of 12, or you may know it's one of any number of all, what do I have? And so you're going to run tests where uh, you look at the results, and like I said, it's kind of like a flowchart, and you go, is this positive or is it negative? And then you just keep following down. Ultimately, to where it separates this group into one individual organism, and you can say, aha, that's what I have. This is an example of a dichotomous key. So for bacteria, the first thing you're going to do is do a gram stain. Is it gram positive or is it gram negative? In this particular case, you said, is it gram positive? No. Okay. So then your next question is, so you eliminate any of the gram uh, positive ones. Now you say, okay, let me look at the shape of it. Is it rod shaped? And you go, yes. Okay, that's going to eliminate any of the sphere, coccyx spherical. So then you say, okay, well, let me look at the oxygen requirements. Is it able to tolerate oxygen? Can it grow in oxygen? And the answer would be yes. Okay, that just knocked out all of your obligate anaerobes. So now you're going, okay, now let me find a test that can help to distinguish between some of these samples. Essentially, if you look down the bottom, you're like, okay, that narrows it down to Shigella, Escherichia, Citrobacter, Enterobacter, or Salmonella. So now you go, okay, let's see what we've got now here. Can it ferment lactose? Yes. Okay, so we're still within those five. Now you go, can it use citric acid? Run that test. The answer is no. Okay, well, that eliminates Citrobacter, Enterobacter, and Salmonella. It leaves you only with Shigella or Escherichia as a, your choices. Find a test that they have different results. So in this case, you would look at, does it produce gas from glucose? Remember the yellow fermentation tube that had acid in the gas? Run that test. And if it produces gas, then, ah, bingo. It's Escherichia. If the answer had been no, that it did not produce gas from glucose, then you would have had Shigella. So the dichotomous key is just, once again, you're going to find we use a lot of vocabulary. We're just annoying you, I know. It's just a flow chart. It's yes or no questions to follow through to so you can identify what the the pathogen is, what the causative agent is. Once you know, why are you doing all this? Well, you most of you are trying to get into the medical field, so we're going to be talking about medical microbiology. You are trying to figure out what is the causative agent of the infection 
of your patient. What is making your patient sick? Once you know that, once you know in this case, okay, it's a Shirishia, now you can develop your treatment plan. You know what antibiotics would be effective against a Shirishia. That's the genus name for E. coli, by the way. Um, you would know, okay, I can't give penicillin because penicillin will not be effective against uh, a gram-negative organism. That's a start, at least.